Hi, I'm Claire and this is my first reading wrap up of 2020. I'm going to tell you about the first five books that I read this year and then when I've read five more I'll do another wrap up and on and on and on like that. For me this works a little bit better than doing monthly wrap ups because I can adjust the format a little bit easier and also because hopefully this video won't end up being nearly as long as if I was telling you all of my January books because it's turning out to be a really good reading month for me. So the first book and in fact the first four books that I read this year were all from my Read for Initiative TBR. So I did a D&D based TBR game. If you haven't seen the video it seemed to go down really really well and I'm really excited to keep doing it but in that video I picked a number of books to read in January and the first four that I read were from that list. Let's talk about the first book that I read which was Blood Air by Amelie. Wen Zhao. This was to fulfill the prompt of having read on the cover and also it was the last book I purchased because it came in my December Illumi crate and it has these beautiful beautiful sprayed edges with like a blood drip on the side which I loved. That's obviously the Illumi crate uh, special edition. I wish I had loved the story in this book as much as I enjoyed the packaging of this book because, uh, spoiler alert, I did not like this book. I was gonna give it a three star at first because there were bits of it that I liked, but then after talking about it a few times uh, with various people, I thought, no, actually I have way too many complaints. So it went down to a two star, not the best start to the reading year, but at least I had a lot of thoughts about it. So this is the story of Anna, who is like a imperial princess in this secondary world, very heavily Russian inspired fantasy land. And she's got this power over people's blood, like her magic is that she can sense blood and control it. It's like that really creepy episode of Avatar The Last Airbender with the waterbender who can also bend blood. It's pretty much like that except that I didn't find it near as creepy. Anna is on the run because she was framed for the murder of her father the emperor but she like saw the person who actually did it so she's looking for that person and in order to find him her last resort that we see at the very beginning of the book is breaking this con man out of jail who she's like heard through the grapevine can help her find the man that she needs revenge on. He's got his own motives, he's also got revenge that he wants to do. So they travel together to find this alchemist who she saw kill her father, but it's not all that easy because this is a world in which magical abilities that are called affinities are reviled and hers is particularly bad. It's very very rare and obviously because it's blood-based people are really afraid of it and she's never been taught how to control it so she can't actually use it safely. There's loads of things that she realizes through the book she might be able to do like healing magic but she doesn't know how to do it because she hasn't been taught because it's so reviled. There is a lot in this book that could have been cool like the magic system is really interesting and the atmosphere of the book is great like the cold and the winter and the kind of Russian based mythology like that's all very cool. However, I just don't think it was executed really well. The characters didn't feel that compelling to me, the romance between the two main characters. Like, you know it's gonna happen because it has that feel of like, oh I see you two are both protagonists in a YA romance. I didn't buy it. It didn't seem to me like they liked each other or were, you know, physically attracted to each other. Anything that might explain why they are in a relationship, they're just traveling together. And this is also a book that had a lot of controversy around it when it was first like in the run-up to being published because some early reviewers read it and said that there was some problematic elements to it. The people with the magical powers in this book, the Affinites, they are basically all indentured servants. They are tricked into coming to Cerulea, the main country that we're in, that Anna is the princess of. They are told there's good jobs to be had in Cerulea, but then as soon as they arrive their papers get taken away, they are 
forced into these terrible quote contracts that are just basically like indentured slavery. And throughout the whole book, Anna comes to realize that the system that she's known her entire life of having the Athenites work for the non Athenites, even if they don't want to, and you know, be in this position where they are feared and reviled and you know, controlled is bad. And the thing is, at the beginning of the book she tells us she's been on the run for a year. It's during the course of this book, which is about two, two, three weeks, something like that, that she comes to realize that the indentured servitude is bad and that there's corruption in her country. And the entire time she's all like, oh, well, it's just because there's some bad people. My brother, the emperor, probably just don't know about it. I'm gonna tell him and then we'll fix the corruption and the badness. And then she's just like, well, you know, as soon as I go back and I tell them there's bad stuff, we can fix the bad stuff because we're in charge. And it's just kind of like really naive. The narrative seems to kind of confirm that that is the case. Like I wouldn't have a problem with a character who's a princess having these naive thoughts, even though I think it's really boring and we've seen it a million times and I'm not really here for, oh no, the world is bad, if only we could have good people be in charge at the very top to fix it in like 2020. I'm just not here for that. But the worst thing about this is that the narrative completely, like the whole story and the way the story works, like completely affirms that and seems to say that that is in fact correct, which makes no sense to me. As I was saying, there was some controversy before this book was released, partly because there was a character that had a very similar storyline to Rue in The Hunger Games, where it's a character who is identified as a black character and then she dies and then her death kind of like spurs on the main character, who is white, to like further, you know, continue fighting for the rights of the uh, indentured servants slash slaves and people with magic powers, which she is one, but also she's a princess. So it just plays into a lot of tropes that we have seen over and over again, like whenever there's a character of color, they are the first to die and all that kind of stuff, you know? Now the author and the publisher decide to delay the book a little bit so they could do some work on it and then release it later. And I think that's to their credit that, you know, they didn't straight away say, no, 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 the criticism is completely invalid. We're going to carry forward the way that sometimes happens whenever there's critique of like systemic problems being represented in books poorly. I'm really not the person to say whether or not like there is still problems in the book in terms of racism because, you know, I'm white, but I would say that there are still a lot of problems for me in terms of the narrative and what the narrative does. I don't think the main relationship is believable. I don't think the characters are developed very well. I don't think from a narrative standpoint it's very good to have a story where, not to go too much into detail, but from the beginning to the end of the book, they are in exactly the same position. <laughs> not much has changed at all except for character work that for me doesn't work because I think it's ridiculous that you know, we have this character who's been living in the regular world among common people for an entire year and she's only just starting to figure out that there is corruption and things are bad. It's a shame because to me what doesn't work here is the story that this author tried to tell. There's not much you can do, you know, to fix that when you're editing the book. For me, the world is really interesting and well drawn out and whether or not there are problematic aspects to that, like, yes, you can talk about that, but again, I'm not the right person to be having that discussion. I would have liked pretty much any other story in that world. I genuinely think there would be such a cool story to be had if this character, Anna, who's suffered greatly at the hands of everyone in the palace who's like telling her that she's a monster because she's this blood witch, she needs to be like tempted down and her power needs to be completely controlled and never come out. Like if Anna were to like run away from the castle, decide on her own 
to leave so that she could go to one of the other countries in this world where she knows that Athenites are not treated the same way. If you had something like that where she decided to leave and she decided to learn how the power works and she decided to focus on learning to use her power for good and ended up, I don't know, in like a training academy or whatever for magical users in a different country and from there she was able to learn like that there are problems and then go into what is presumably the plot of the future books which is that she's going to join this like revolutionary movement that is being started. I mean presumably in the end she's going to take the throne of Cerulea because she's the imperial princess and that is kind of like a thing that should happen once she's cleared her name but again with the like complete naivete of this character like I don't think this character is meant to be portrayed as like not smart we're not told she's a genius but we're certainly not told that she's dim either but she goes like oh yeah I murdered the emperor but in my country you're all entitled to a fair trial so I'm just gonna go into the palace where I supposedly murdered the emperor and just tell them I didn't do it, here's why, and then everything will be hunky-dory. That's her plan for the whole book. Of course it's gonna go wrong, and so then when it goes wrong it's entirely unsurprising. She's not 12, you know? <laughs> She's, I don't know, 16, 18, something like that. She should be able to have the critical thinking faculties to think like, actually, no, it's not gonna work. If she were even thinking, you know, this would not work for anybody else, but I'm the imperial princess, it might work for me, that I would 100% buy. I would be like, okay, so she realizes that it's a completely bonkers situation, but she feels very entitled, that would work, but it's not like that. And there were things in this story that were so, so predictable, like what happened with Anna at the end, but at the same time, plenty of things in the story came as like a complete 180 turn that you had no way to anticipate as a reader. So it wasn't like plot twist and then you go back and you're able to see kind of the seeds of it being sown. It wasn't really like that. It was just kind of like the author went like, plot twist, gotcha, you didn't see it coming, but we had no way to see it coming. There's a big plot twist like kind of in the middle of the book, which, reveals that the villain is in fact an Athenite. I'm not gonna say who in case you want to read this book, but we end up having a story that is all about the fact that Athenites are oppressed and distrusted and unfairly judged and then it turns out, in fact, the villain all along, instead of being, you know, this unfair system that Anna wants to bring down, no, the villain is a single Athenite person crazed with power or something like that and just wants to save all of the other Athenites but by being a tyrant. Why? 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 It's kind of like saying slavery's bad but the ultimate villain is a slave themselves? It's just not good. It's not a good look. I mean, yeah, as you can see, I am still like very annoyed at some of the things that this book did that really, really irritated me. But the reason I'm annoyed is that there were things in here that I actively liked. And again, I'm gonna say the magic system, the atmosphere, I found it quite easy to read and carry on reading even though I was very irritated by certain things like the focus on Anna's feelings about whether or not her family, the ruling family of the entire empire, were in fact condoning corruption and you know indentured slavery which she should have known that, that was a thing all along. Anyway, at least it's a two stars where I have some strong feelings about it unlike another book that we are going to talk about in a minute. But fortunately, before we get to that, the next two things that I read were both NetGalley Arcs and they were both great. So first up, I read Come Tumbling Down by Shauna McGuire. It fulfilled the prompt of reading a book by a favourite author in my Read for Initiative uh, roles. This is the fifth book in the Wayward Children series, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to say too, too much about the actual, like, plot summary of this because it kind of would be a spoiler for the first couple of books in the series. But this whole series is about children who have travelled through doors to different magical 
portal fantasy lands and then have come back to the mundane world and they have to kind of figure out how to live in the world again and in order to do that they are sent to Eleanor West's school for wayward children and in the first book Every Heart a Doorway we are at the school and we meet two characters called Jack and Jill. They are sisters and they travel to a world called the Moors which is like a really gothic world with a vampire and a mad scientist and they had adventures there. We get to see their adventures on the moors in more detail in the second book Down Among the Sticks and Bones which is in fact a prequel focusing on them. Since Every Heart a Doorway in the story world a few years have passed and now in the school we are seeing some characters we met in different books in the series. They are confronted with Jack again. And that's all I'm going to say about the actual story of the book. I really really liked it. I loved being back in this world. It wasn't as good for me as some of the other stories in the Wayworld Children books. I really really loved Every Hearted Away and Down Among the Sticks and Bones. This one I thought it worked really well but it kind of suffered from the fact that you know Jack showed up and had something that she needed to do and had a plan that she told the rest of the kids about and then they all set a way to do the plan together and then they did the plan and so it's just kind of like there was no big surprise moment you know it was really enjoyable being back in that world and seeing what everybody was up to and it was cool to see their adventure together and it was still you know really high costs and prices to be paid for everything in those worlds because it's quite unrelenting but there wasn't a big no kind of moment that I've had in other books by Shauna Maguire and especially in this series you know where there's a big like twist at the end where you've tempted destiny and then destiny comes back and goes like nope you can't do that. It was really enjoyable but it lacked a certain wow factor. I gave it a four star because it's a series that I loved and I loved being back into it again. I read it super quickly in a day. I was very happy to be reading it but it was just a little bit shy of outstanding which is where some of the rest of the series has been for me so I don't want to sound like I'm super down on it because I loved it and it is a four star but you know you should read the whole series. The whole series is so great. Next up I read Finna by Nino Cipri. This was also a Net Galley arc and this one was to fulfill the prompt of reading a Net Galley arc in my uh, Read for Initiative TBR. I loved it so much. This was my first five stars of the year. This is the one that is about two minimum wage workers at a big box furniture store that is most definitely not Ikea because presumably the author doesn't want to get sued but it pretty much is. It is a normal work day for both of them. They're trying to deal with the fact that they recently broke up but have to see each other at work and then on top of that they find out that there is a multi-dimensional portal that opened in the middle of their store and they find this out when a little grandma like walks through one of the portals and disappears and they are sent to fetch her from the multiverse. I loved basically everything about this. The only thing that I would say is I wish it had been longer because it was so much fun. I love the character, their relationship felt like something I was so invested in even from the beginning because there was clearly like a lot of unresolved stuff there and tension and then the traveling in the multiverse was really fun and really creepy at times. There was one moment in the book that managed to be like such a gut punch where they realize what it is that they actually have to do on this mission uh, and yeah it takes a whole other kind of tenor at that point I was reading this book and I literally like went oh shit like I stopped reading and swore out loud because there was this one moment that like really really blew me away. It's so great. I'm looking forward to reading more of what Nino CP comes up with. Highly highly recommend picking that one up when it comes out which is I think 
late February, something like that. So that's Thinner by Nino Sibri. Next up we have The Con Artist by Fred Van Lente with illustrations by Tom Fowler. This I picked because it had yellow on the cover. It's not much on the front cover but it is on the spine and the back cover. This was of course one of the prompts from Read for Initiative. This I bought a while back because it is set at a convention. In fact it is set at San Diego Comic Con. I am in fandom and I love fandom and I wanted to see more about like convention and video games and books and all that kind of stuff. I love seeing fandom represented in books. Unfortunately in this uh, I thought it was very poorly done. This is the second book that I gave a two star to this month and uh, this one on the copy spreadsheet literally had no mark that was above eh, didn't care. <laughs> like all of it, the characters, the writing, the atmosphere, the logic, none of it to me worked. So in this book we follow Mike, a comic book writer who's really not in a very good place at the moment. He goes to San Diego Comic Con because he was invited and because he is going to give a lifetime achievement award to his mentor, the man who trained him. Except he learns as he like lands in San Diego that his mentor has just passed away. He's very very upset but he can't leave because he doesn't actually have a home that he lives at. He separated from his ex-wife, she got the house and everything. He basically lives in his car and goes from con to con just being put up in hotels so it's just not a really good stage in life for him. He ends up in the hotel bar on the first night of the con. The guy that his wife cheated on him with like comes up to him and they start to talk and the guy insults his dead mentor so so Mike decks him in the face and gets thrown out of the convention center. Fast forward a few hours and the police are knocking on his hotel room door to tell him that the guy that he was seen having a fist fight with earlier in the night has been murdered and he's a suspect. And so of course what Mike decides to do is to be really unhelpful and rude to the police while he is being suspected of murder so that he can go and solve the case on his own in his spare time after he's spent the day drawing commissions at the con. The thing is this book believes that it is both smarter and woker than it in fact actually is. We've got this narration from Mike which we can tell from the very beginning the way that it's introduced that he is in fact giving a deposition at some point uh, and in fact it ends with him like walking into the office of the cop that he's you know giving the deposition to so it ends really abruptly as well like there's loads of plot threads that are left unresolved because it's all in Mike's voice it's all Mike's internal commentary where he's telling us a lot of stuff about the comic book industry and how we should do certain things better. Some of the things that the narrative is doing is clearly like trying to be woke and smart. There's a side storyline about a fellow comic book artist who is a woman and has this table next to Mike at the convention and they kind of talk about the guy who was murdered at some point and she reveals that he sexually harassed her and you know you see Mike taking her side. Later on someone offers Mike to like give him this woman's job because supposedly her copies of the comic aren't moving or whatever and it's just really an excuse to take her out and put Mike in her place and he doesn't want to do that because she's his friend and because he can see through the bullshit. So on the one side you have that but on the other hand like there's a lot of stereotypical sexist, condescending attitudes towards so many different people. I'm fairly sure that at some point he describes a person who is a bad guy and has a Jewish sounding name as a goblin. So it's kind of that level. Everything is so stereotypical. It thinks it is so much smarter than it is. Like at some point in his detectiving, I guess, he has to go and talk to the Eastboro Baptist Church that is picketing the uh, comic book convention and like you know telling people that comic book fans will go to hell or whatever and so he goes and talks to them and does this whole monologue treating the Bible as if it's like a fictional arc on a show and like how oh the showrunner changed between the Old and the New Testament. They completely change the characterization of God you know and it's just like oh you think it's smart that you've done that and not like really predictable. <laughs> it would be 
funny in a kind of like oh I gave a small chuckle sort of way if he did it for one line but it just goes on and on and on and it's not like it's not smart and you're not the first person to have said that to them on day three of San Diego Comic-Con I can guarantee <laughs> like you think it's a really small joke but you didn't actually invent it come on the mystery element itself of who killed this guy that Mike was seen having an argument with and then who killed subsequent people who die in the book wasn't anything that you as the reader could parse together based on clues and it's not just me being bad at mysteries because I said that about Blood Air as well right like I looked at the Goodreads review for this and I was not the only person who thought that the mystery like was just he figured it out and then he told us about it but there was no way that we could have figured it out you know a good mystery plot line whether it's in a mystery novel or any kind of other novel like you're supposed to know enough from the clues throughout the book that you will have a oh no moment where you figure it out like maybe a page or half a page before the character so that you see them work it out you understand they're working it out and when they tell you that they figured it out you're right there with them but you don't want something where it's immediately obvious to you therefore it's irritating that the character is doing things that make no sense and you also don't want to find out and then be like what okay i guess which is what happened in this <laughs> this book was annoying <laughs> nothing in it was good everything was average and meh it made no sense the writing wasn't great the writing was often quite offensive it was not fond or kind or loving in terms of looking at fandom and the main character was a dislikable dude who thought he was smarter and edgelordier than he actually was so and finally after a few days where I felt almost like a bit of a reading slump because the con artist had really annoyed me and because my read for initiative TBR up till that point had been really hit and miss and I didn't want another miss I decided to go and pick up something that's not from the read for initiative TBR but in fact something that I've been looking forward to reading for a while and that is Catfishing on Catnet by Naomi Kritzer. This came out in late 2019 and a few friends of mine had read it and absolutely loved it so I definitely wanted to try it out and uh, it was a good thing that I did because it was delightful and I adored it. Catfishing on Catnet is about Steph and her mom who move around very very often don't really stay in the same place for more than maybe three to six months because Steph's really scary dad is after them. So Steph has grown up knowing that her dad is a stalker and he's always after her and her mom and that's why they have to move all the time. So Steph isn't really able to make friends in all of these new places that they go to because they are there for such a short period of time. The place that her real true friends are is Catnet which is a social network online secretly run by an AI and the currency on Catnet is animal pictures and preferably cat pictures. Catnet is run by this AI that calls itself Cheshire Cat and it is in the same like network group as Steph. Both of them uh, narrate the story in alternating chapters and both of them are just great great characters. The friendships that Steph makes both in the real world at her brand new school right after they've moved and in the clouder which is what a group chat is called on catnet those friendships feel so real like so true to life I've read some books this month that didn't have great characterization but this was so on point and I loved it so so much and the story kicks off when Steph and her mom arrive in a brand new town Steph is enrolled at the school she doesn't really love it there except that she meets this girl called Rachel who is a great artist and they like form a really strong friendship straight away and she is starting to kind of want to let her guard down a little bit I don't want to say too much because there are a lot of twists and turns but I 
really, really love this. I mean, you know, the point of a thriller is to make you tense and scared and worry for the characters, and it did all of those things. Absolutely love the characters in this book, absolutely love their friendships. There is a romance subplot between Steph and Rachel later on in the book, but it really isn't like front and center, you know, it really doesn't take over the book. It is something that like they talk about, but they also kind of say, you know, maybe we can talk about it when we're not in mortal danger. And I really appreciated that. There's also a lot of like casual representation in this book that is done really well. Most of the people in Steph's online group are um, LGBTQ plus in some way or another. And it's just like something that's mentioned, but is not made a big deal out of. And it's just like a fact of life as it is in real life as we experience it so it was really cool to see because it just it felt true to life as much as it was about robots and AIs and a world in which you know there is a lot more robotic everywhere than our current world so much of the character beats felt really realistic and I was very attached to this friend group like from really early on like they felt like online friendships I've had and there's points when they meet in person and you know if you've ever had that feeling, if you've ever met some online friends in person who are very important to you and you get to meet them in person and give them real life hugs, like it is very special and it made me feel all warm inside. But also I need to emphasize the fact that the dad is terrifying. The father character is so scary and you get to see both from Steph's point of view, the kind of trauma that she had that her mother has, also from the point of view of Cheshire Cat, the AI, like what it finds when it investigates the dad, like it is scary. And I actually think it balanced the level of scariness with the level of like, this is very realistic to everyday life, like pretty well. I did give it a five stars, absolutely, absolutely loved it. I am going to go back and look like what else Naomi Kritzer has written because it was my first book by her and I, loved it and I was also very happy with myself because out of those five books three of them were net galley arcs. I had a net galley arc of catfishing on catnet plus of course Finna and come tumbling down so I have brought my ratio up from like 21 to 28 percent just in those five books. It would have been more except that I requested another book from Ned Galley because my friends were loving it and recommending it. So there we go, this was my first reading wrap up of 2020. I decided to go to the format of, you know, every five books do a wrap up in order to um, maybe not have videos that are as long, but I feel like this one is going to be a long one because I spent quite a lot of time ranting about those books I didn't like, so whoops. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below if you've read any of those books, what did you think? think about them, if you enjoyed this format, if you thought that it went on for too long or not long enough, too many spoilers, not enough spoilers. If you think I should be doing anything differently, please do let me know. If you'd like to see more from me, you can check out a previous video on screen right now. And if you haven't yet, please hit the subscribe button that's on my face for a new video from me every week. I've been Claire, thanks so much for watching and see you soon.